Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Recently, I talked about Astra and, well, their launch that went sideways. Now, they actually build rockets across the bay from me in Alameda, and actually, they also test the engines there sometimes, which, incidentally, it's not far from where the Mythbusters did some of their more spectacular experiments. But we don't actually see rockets being launched in the Bay Area because it's a heavily populated region. But not far from my house, there were some large missiles stationed that many people didn't know existed. For decades, the US operated nuclear-tipped surface-to-air missiles around San Francisco and indeed around many US cities. This was a system known as Nike Hercules and it was the successor to Nike Ajax, uh, which can actually lay claim to being the first widely deployed surface-to-air missile. Nike began development in 1945, while World War II was still in progress. At the time, anti-aircraft guns were the main defensive system and they weren't very accurate. They needed thousands of shells to score a kill. And planes that were flying higher and faster were just going to make it harder. Even if you had computer-controlled gun batteries, there was still random dispersion just due to flex in the barrel and, you know, propellant in the shells. That It meant that the detonation point accuracy was, or error, was larger than the shell's kill radius. Now, I, by the way, I should also point out that the potential for guided surface-to-air missiles was recognized by Germany before this, and they had been developing something called the Wasserfall system. Uh, that started development in 1941, but even with dozens of test launches during the war, it never reached operational status. Uh, also, Wasserfall was guided by human control, initially by optical tracking, but later they would use a radar beam guidance system that was developed to help the operator. So anyway, 1945, the US began developing the Nike system, and it would use multiple ground-based radars and an analog computer to guide the missile to its target, which was clearly a step up from what uh, Germany had worked on. And I'll be honest, I'm actually way more interested in how that analog computer operated compared to the actual rocket motors, because I kind of know how they work, but analog computers are a black art as far as I'm concerned. There were wonderful assemblies of tuned electronics and bespoke electronic part or mechanical parts that, you know, were needed to do the math in the days before that you could have a compact digital computer in your pocket, right? The first missile of the Nike system was just named Nike, and it would later be known as Nike Ajax when Nike Hercules was developed. So Nike was originally a two-stage system with a simple high thrust solid first stage motor that would boost the guided second stage to the required altitude and speed. The whole missile was about 10 meters long and it massed about one metric ton. The first stage generated 20 tons of thrust for about three and a half seconds, pushing the missile to Mach 2 in a near vertical trajectory before the second stage was released and it began heading towards the target. So the second stage was the really complicated part of the system. It had aerodynamic controls for steering, it had a rocket engine, a sustainer engine, that was burning jet fuel and red fuming nitric acid. Uh, it had a warhead, which was actually three different warheads, massing about 140 kilograms in total, and yes, a lot of cutting-edge 1950s avionics to enable the bi-directional radio communications and control from the ground. The, the sustainer engine would burn for about 30 seconds, and in that time, the missile would continue to steer towards its target, even after the engine had burned out. So this could launch up to 70,000 feet and be able to intercept targets out to about 45 kilometers, depending upon the altitude. But partway through development, it was realized that this was just not going to be able to handle the scenarios that the US was planning for. The threat had evolved. Planners now anticipated massed squadrons of bombers, no longer carrying gravity bombs, but with missiles that could be fired at targets miles away. One analysis pointed out that the target tracking radar didn't have sufficient resolution to distinguish targets that were close together, and the resolution was worse than the effective kill radius of the warhead. So a missile launched at a squadron of tightly packed aircraft would likely fly through the middle and detonate and fail to kill a single target. Now, one might reasonably assume that in response to this, they began improving the design of the radar to fix this shortcoming. But no, this was the 1950s, and the solution was instead to increase the kill radius by using a nuclear warhead. Yeah. 
The Nike Ajax was narrow. It was only 37 centimeters in diameter. That's about a, a 15 inches. And this meant that most warheads of the time simply wouldn't fit in. There was the WX-9, which is, was designed to fit inside a 12 inch shell and be fired from a cannon. But this was a really expensive and inefficient warhead. To make it skinny, it used a gun type core assembly mechanism where you would fire a subcritical mass of uranium into another mass of uranium. And that meant that it needed about five times as much fissile material compared to a more common, more efficient spherical implosion device. So. That was never going to be viable. Instead, they decided to build a much bigger rocket, the Nike Hercules, and it began development. It would be able to communicate, or sorry, accommodate a 500 kil kilo warhead and deliver it to targets about 150 kilometers away, flying at an altitude of up to 100,000 feet and speeds in excess of Mach 3. So for the first boost stage, the design, they just clustered four of the previous boosters together, added big fins to keep it straight during that boost. The second stage, uh, they got rid of the liquid fueled engine, which had the really toxic propellants, and just used a solid motor that burned for about 30 seconds. The, they changed the layout of the control surfaces and the whole aerodynamic design. It was a bit longer, about 12 meters, and it massed about 4.8 tons. So the warhead on that was the W31, which was a high-tech boosted fission implosion device. It probably had selectable yields. I've seen that it could do two kiloton, 20 or 40 kilotons. More commonly, however, there was a 500 kilogram conventional warhead. I hear that the US batteries probably had three conventional warheads for every single nuclear warhead. And obviously other countries that they sold it to didn't have the nuclear option available to them. Despite the radical redesign of the missile, it actually kept the same ground control hardware for guidance. So both missiles operated in basically the same manner with exactly the same computer, maybe with some variables tweaked. Now you might have an idea of how a surface to air missile operates, heading upwards from the launch site directly towards the target. But Nike didn't work like this. It would initially boost upwards to its altitude and then it would arc over such that it would typically approach its targets from above. So how the guidance works with Nike was that there was a target tracking radar which would be pointed at the target and they would find the target using other scanning radar systems but this one would fix on the target and the mount, you know, the azimuth and the altitude would be sent to the computer as well as the distance. And similarly there was a, a tracking antenna and that wouldn't rely on radar because the missile actually had a transponder on it. And it too would return the range and the direction, the altitude and the azimuth. But it would also send commands and receive data from the missile. The missile tracking antenna couldn't be too close to the launch site because it had to be able to turn fast enough to track the missile. So if the missile went straight up if, and the radar was too close, it wouldn't be able to track that. Also, if the trajectory would carry over this antenna, it wouldn't be able to twist around quickly enough near the zenith. So that constrained where they could situate these things and fire things. So anyway, the guidance computer, it would just send steering signals in pitch and yaw to the missile. And the missile follows these, but it had its onboard smarts. It had accelerometers and gyroscopes that were all in the control loop. The roll was cancelled out locally and the control uh, surfaces for pitch and yaw were constrained by the gyroscopes and accelerometers to keep the turn at the commanded rates. So the detonation was controlled from the ground and a fraction of a second before the intercept, the warhead would be commanded to detonate, ensuring optimal spread of shrapnel from the conventional warhead. And I imagine that the nuclear warhead had a little more wiggle room for the detonation. The nuclear version also had a surface attack profile, which was in theory a good and useful capability for many of the sites that were on the coast, less so for those in the middle of the country. For safety reasons, if contact was lost with the ground station for more than two seconds, the missile would destroy itself. It could either detonate the, miss the warhead if it was a conventional warhead, or if it was a nuclear warhead, they would use a one-point detonation. Instead of uh, imploding the device, they would just destroy the implosion system. And you would have a sort of, instead of a nuclear blast, you would have a radiation-rich pile of debris. 
there was another safety system that was important for the warhead. It would control arming of the warhead based on atmospheric pressure to make sure that it wasn't armed when it was uh, sitting at the base. And it included like a distinctive nose sensor that kind of resembled a harpoon. The non-nuclear version wouldn't need this, of course, but they included dummy versions on all the missiles so that casual inspection wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the missiles if you were just looking at them. So Nike Hercules would have been a formidable defense against formations of bombers that were mounting an attack on the United States. However, by the time that Nike Hercules was deployed in 1958, the Soviet Union had already demonstrated the ability to launch warheads on rockets, and the equations changed again. So they did actually demonstrate that a Nike Hercules could in theory shoot down a ballistic missile by intercepting a corporal ballistic missile, but it really wasn't well designed or well suited for anti-ballistic missile work. And so the Nike Zeus was proposed, which was bigger and faster still, and it used a completely different guidance system. Um, it was tested, but it never really made it to operational status. They also promoted it as a anti-satellite weapon, never got deployed like that either. And of course, during the whole career, the US never actually fired any of its Nike missiles at live targets. It was never used in anger. There was actually a demonstration of the Hercules with the nuclear warhead in November of 1962. The US carried out what would be its last atmospheric test using a Hercules on Johnston Island in the South Pacific. It detonated the warhead at 69,000 feet, practically over the island. The test was codenamed Tightrope, and it was the final test of Operation Dominic that had many other high-altitude tests, including the much more famous Starship Prime shot that exploded at 400 kilometers altitude. The US shut down most of the Nike sites by 1974 as part of the SALT Treaty, and that included the SF-88 site near me. Although there were a number of other coastal sites that remained active a little longer. There's a couple of sites in Alaska that remained active until 1979. And around the world, there were other nations that kept their missiles running well into the 1990s, obviously lacking the extra spicy warhead option. The Nike booster stage also found use in a lot of different sounding rocket designs used for research, and usually the names are based on the first and second stage, so you had things like Nike Apache, Nike Javelin, Nike Tomahawk, and even Nike Nike. The most enduring model I can find is the Nike Tomahawk, which continued to fly right up until 1995. So look, I know this isn't my usual space content, but it is something from rocket history and it's practically in my backyard and I wanted to share it with you. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.